Amen. What a wonderful song, and I appreciate you being here today. Uh, when we were missionaries uh, in Argentina, we were there for 11 years, and uh, we had uh, some things that were challenging, but some things we just, you know, really had to suffer for the Lord. Uh, I really, really, really like steak. I, f- I figured I'd get, in, we're in Texas, right? I figured I'd get a couple amens out of that. Uh, and uh, I know some of you do as well. And in Argentina, they have, I believe, the best steak in the world. Some of you have been there, and you can confirm that with me. Uh, they have a, a, a type of uh, cattle that they raised that specially brought over uh, back in the 1800s, 1700s from the Spaniards. Uh, and these cattle get gigantic, and they raise them with no preservatives, no steroids, no uh, antibiotics, none of that stuff, grass-fed for a long, long time. And it produces some really, really good steak. And the reason I say that is because one of the times for my birthday, and we won't tell you which birthday it was because we're keeping that to ourselves, but uh, one of my birthdays, I decided that I wanted to go downtown uh, and go to one of the great, the premier steakhouses in uh, Buenos Aires, the capital city of Argentina, to La Estancia, and go there and get a steak. But when you go to a restaurant to get a steak in Argentina, uh, it's about an hour to two-hour process because of the way they cook and grill the meat. Uh, And so when we went there, uh, I wanted, I had in mind what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I had the guts to try to do it. But they have at this particular restaurant an anniversary steak. And it's about a pound and three quarters. Uh, It basically, it's not a roast, but it looks kind of like a roast. Okay, Uh, it is gigantic, but it is real sirloin, a a phenomenal steak, great taste, but it's it's about, you know, this big. I'm like the, the, I'm not like a fisherman here, okay? I'm not telling you I caught a fish this big. It's really this big, and it's about that high. And uh, so I thought to myself, you know, if there's any time to do this, it's on my birthday. So I went there, and it got the steak, and I ate it. And normally when I eat steak, if I go to a steakhouse here in the States or wherever else it may be, they give you a little 10, 12, 16-ounce steak if you spend a lot of money, maybe 22, 24 ounces. Uh, And I eat that, and if it's really good steak, I enjoy it. And then I go, man, I wish there was some more. And I know most of you are looking at me like, well, preacher, you can eat a 22-ounce steak and they'll still wish some more. Yes, I do. Uh, I have some kind of hole in my stomach that steak only fills, and I I have to have a lot of it. And so I ate this steak, and I can tell you that it was a struggle at the end. It really was. I had the salad and the potato and all the stuff to go with it, the bread and everything. And it wasn't kind of any kind of eating contest. I'm just doing this on my own, right? Uh, I ate the steak, and when I got to the last couple bites, it really was, you know, I came here to do this, and I'm going to conquer. I'm going to win. I'm going to be victorious. So it was kind of put the steak in your mouth, and, you know, uh, I wasn't really enjoying it, to be honest with you, at the end. Because it it took me about an hour to eat the steak. It was so big. Can I tell you that when I got finished with that steak, I didn't want any more steak. <laughs> Matter of fact, the lady came over, and I love the desserts they have there. They have some amazing desserts. She said, do you want some dessert? And I said, no. No. I said, just bring the check. I don't want any more water. I don't want any more tea. I don't want any more bread. As a matter of fact, if you, I love cookies, and if you'd have brought out the best cookie in the world, I would have said, no thanks. I was full. As a matter of fact, I don't want to get into it, but I was really full, okay? I, I did not want anything else. I was completely and utterly satisfied. And maybe you can think about in your life a time when you had a meal that was like that, that satisfied you, and you really didn't know if you are going to eat for another couple days. Now, of course, we do. You know, I'm not going to eat for three more days after this, you know, well, and then that night you're eating something else. But... I felt like I could be satisfied for a long time. We're going to find in our text today some people that had that experience with the Lord. Look with me in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. Mark, chapter 6. There were some people that were hungry, and they got completely satisfied. Mark, chapter 6, in verse 30. Mark 6, 30. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to read through the text of the Scripture today, and we're going to uh, preach the message in the text, okay? So we're going to go verse by verse, and we're going to kind of preach through it. Uh, we're not going to read it all and then come back to it. We're just going to start off. Uh, we got a lot to share with you today, so we're just going to read it through and preach it as we go. Mark 6.30 says this, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Now, we have just concluded a couple weeks ago, we're going in the life of Christ uh, in our series on Sunday morning, we're going through chronologically, so it doesn't match up in the Gospels, because the Gospels put the stories in there according to the theme and what they're trying to teach, they don't put everything in there chronologically. If you start out in the first chapter of Matthew and go to the end of the book of Matthew, it doesn't all, it's not all recorded in exactly in chronological order. Matthew was trying to accomplish something with the Gospel uh, that he wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and so he doesn't put it all in chronological order. So what we're doing in our, in our study is that we're going through the chronological actual order of the events in the life of Christ. And so when we see this, what happened is, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, Jesus prayed all night on the mountain and then he sent out the 12 apostles on their mission. And if you remember that message, they were sent out and they weren't supposed to uh, beg or, or take any script or any sandals or any shoes or anything like that. They're supposed to go to the houses, they're supposed to preach the gospel, and they're supposed to do these things. And we talked about our mission uh, as a church now in 2022. And so that has just happened. And now the apostles have come back to Jesus and they've told him everything that happened during their mission. But at the same time, a very tragic event has happened and John the Baptist has been beheaded. And we don't have time to get into that whole story and why that occurred and how it occurred. But Jesus obviously loved John the Baptist. And he was uh, upset. And he was grieved by the death of John the Baptist. You have to understand, Jesus is not aloof in all these events that happen in the Gospels. He's not sitting there going, oh, well, that's too bad. No, he is grieving. He's grieving the loss of John the Baptist. That was a huge situation for the disciples and even a prerequisite to look forward to the death of Jesus. Even his own death is being reminded of him because of John the Baptist's martyrdom. Now, when we see this in verse 30, the, all of those things have come in on the apostles and Jesus, and it's really overwhelming. They are in a place where they are stressed out, like we used to say in high school, they're stressed out to the max. I mean, they, they, they've been ministering and ministering, and they've had the loss of one of their great brethren. They've had the mission. They've come back, and they're, they're weary, they're tired, they're frustrated, they're stressed. Verse 31, Jesus said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Now, the best way I can describe this is if you have your whole family, not just your mom and dad, not just your brothers and sisters. If you have your whole family over for Thanksgiving, okay, now think about that in your mind. Some of us have, in our extended family, probably 100 people, okay? So let's say that they come over, and they wouldn't all fit in my house. They'd be out in my yard. We'd have to set up tents. We'd have to set up tents out on the sidewalk. We'd have people everywhere, okay? And let's say that they come, and you're going to minister to them, and you're going to feed them and take care of them. And then they said, well, you know, we like it here so much, we're going to stay till Christmas, so you got hundreds of people in and out of your house, and they're living there with you, and they're a family. And we're not going to get into all that, but they're family, okay? And you're dealing with this, and you're dealing with this day after day. You're trying to work your job, and you're trying to minister. That's what the disciples are going through right now. But it's not 100 people. It's thousands of people. And they're ministering to them day after day. And Jesus is doing miracles and Jesus is teaching. But the disciples are cleaning up and they're ministering to people. And they're helping people get here and there. And they're feeding them and they're doing all these things. And they are wore out. So Jesus says, we need a break. Never thought Jesus would say that, did you? But Jesus understands that even God, when he created the world, not because he was tired or physically exhausted, 
But God established the rhythm and the pattern for our life and what is best. And he created the world in six days and he rested on the seventh. You need to rest. You can't keep giving and giving if you don't rest. And part of the problem in our society today is that we don't rest. Y'all can take that for what you need. And I'll leave it right there. Verse 32 says, and they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Now, I love this. It's, you have to put all the Gospels together and a whole bunch of historical commentaries to understand what's actually happening here. Let me lay it out for you. What's happening here is that the disciples are getting in the boat to go across to Bethsaida, the fishing village across the, lake of, of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. So what they're doing is they're getting in Peter's fishing boat. Most of the time they traveled in his boat. Most of the time, Jesus taught out of his boat. So all the crowd that wants to see the miracles and wants to hear Jesus teach recognizes by now Peter's boat. I mean, they understand, hey, there goes Peter's boat. They're sailing. Look at that. Jesus is leaving. Let's go find out where he's going. So what happened was Peter and the disciples and Jesus are in the boat, and they're sailing across. It's about a two-hour journey over about 10 miles across the lake, uh, across the Sea of Galilee where they're going. And so the, the people that could run fast go on land. It's only three and a half miles to go around land. So they ran around there following Peter's boat. Now, don't forget the apostles, the disciples are wore out. They're stressed. They might have seen some of these people take off and start running. And I can imagine in my mind, now this is me, not the Word of God. I don't have any proof of text for this. But I can just imagine Peter putting the sails back a little bit. Hey, slow it down a little bit, man. Let's take our time to get across there. Maybe they'll get tired and they'll leave. Because <laughs> he sees all these people running around there and he's like, oh, man, here we go again. We're going to have to minister to all these people. So they get to the other side. They get to the fishing village of Bethsaida. And all the people are there. And many of people read through this in the Bible, they don't understand. There's no way in the world, matter of fact, some people say this is the reason you can't believe in the miracle. There's no way in the world that this little fishing village has got 5,000 men in it. You ever thought about that? See, what's going on is this is right before the Passover. We know that because there's green grass involved, and it's springtime. And they're making their way, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, are making their way around the lake. This was their trek to go to Jerusalem to have the Passover. So there's crowds and crowds of people coming around to Bethsaida to stop there to hear the teaching of Jesus. And then they're going to go on to the temple and go to Passover and celebrate the Passover. So verse 33 says, The people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and outwent them, and came together unto him. Now think about this. The disciples are trying to get a vacation. You know? It's like if I went to the Bahamas with my wife to try to have vacation, and then all of y'all followed me down there. And I get to the hotel, and there all of y'all are sitting there. I'd be like, wait a minute. I was trying to get away from you. No, know, I wasn't trying to get away from y'all. <laughs> That's what's happened. And, but notice Jesus' response. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them. He didn't get upset. He didn't go, hey, we just left the other side of the shore to get away from y'all people. We went on to vacation. We're trying to get away from this. We're trying to de-stress. No, no, no. That's not Jesus' response. He saw all of them and he was moved with compassion because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. You know, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of that day weren't any better than our religious leaders today. They couldn't help these people. They couldn't give them the true words of life. They couldn't give them anything that would satisfy them. And Jesus can. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, Now the disciples have done good. So far, Peter hasn't had an aneurysm. He hasn't blowed up or anything. Uh, all these people, they're still serving him. Jesus is still teaching on the side of the mountain. There's, there's 10,000 people now that have gathered. At least some scholars think even maybe 15,000 people are out on the, the, the valley there and underneath the, the mountain. And Jesus is teaching and ministering and healing the sick. And the disciples are back at it again, doing everything they always do. So Peter and all the disciples let all that go all day. And they serve the Lord and they do, they do well. But now they've really had it. Notice verse 35. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. 
Send them away that they may go into the country roundabout and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Now, you've got to imagine, look at, look, in your imagination, think about this now. Jesus is on the mountain. He's teaching there on the hillside. And there's ten to 15,000 people spread out all over the valley, right in between there and the shoreline of the water. And here they are. They've been out there all day. Uh, it's in the springtime, so it may not have been real hot, but it's not comfortable to sit out in a valley like that for that all day long. They've listened. They've ministered. They've served. And now the sun is setting. It's in the second evening for the Jewish people, about 6 to 7 o'clock before they can see three stars. Now we know that the sun is going down. All the stores are closing. You know, there's no QT's about to shut down. They're not going to be able to get any food. And the disciples go, man, we're finally done. Jesus, they go to Jesus. They go, send them away. It's too late. We can't do anything about it. They're just going to have to find something on the way home. And then Jesus says in verse 37, I just wished I could have been there when Jesus said this to Peter. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. Say what? What? What did you just say, Jesus? You, you know, you can, you know, you can count, you can see the people, right? There's 10,000 people out there. And you want us to give them something to eat? Peter's probably checking his ears to make sure he heard that right. And they say unto him, now this is as, as kind and, and unsarcastic as they can be. It's actually Philip that says this because Jesus actually went to Philip to, to, to test him, the Bible says in the Gospel of John. So Philip responds and says, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Now that doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But 200 penny worth in that time was a laborer's year's worth of wages. So what he just said here in American culture and, and economy is, should we go out and spend $100,000 to feed these people? Now think about this. We've done some uh, rodeo Sundays, and we've done some big days, and we've had 700 people here before, and we fed them barbecue. We did that one time. One time. <laughs> and then your pastor didn't do it no more. Cost a lot of money. But just imagine... That we had a big day out here on this whole entire property, and we gathered together 15,000 people from Sherman. And we're going to feed them barbecue. Well, barbecue is at least $15 a piece to cater. $150,000 worth of food? They don't have that kind of money. And then it gets worse. He said unto them, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. So now the disciples are completely wore out. They're super stressed. And now they've got to go through the whole entire 10,000 people crowd and go, hey, you got any food? Nope. Okay. You got any food? Nope. Okay. You got any food? No. Nobody's got food. Finally, Andrew comes along and he's, he's got this little kid. And he goes, hey, this kid's got a lunch. It's just only five loaves of bread and two fishes. But that's all we got. They went through the whole crowd of 10,000 people, and all they found was one little sack lunch. These people truly were waiting on a miracle. <laughs> How do you get 10,000 people there that nobody brought food? So he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Now, I've always thought about why did Jesus do this? Number one, he set them down on the green grass because it was more comfortable. They're going to be there a while. You understand how long it takes to feed? When we did the, the Sunday, uh, rodeo Sunday, it took us probably almost an hour just to feed 700 people. This is going to take hours. So Jesus wanted to be comfortable while they're sitting there. But he also organized everybody in rows of 150s. He set everybody together so they could fellowship, but also so the disciples would have rows to walk down because if you tried to trip over 10,000 people with food, you'd make a mess out of everything. Jesus is always but organized. He's not the author of confusion and everything that God does. He does it in an organized manner and in the most efficient way possible. 
So he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass, and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves. Now, this is an amazing thing. Because Jesus is our perfect example. In everything, every aspect of the Christian life, if you want to know, should we pray and thank God for the food? Yes. Because Jesus did. Now listen to me. Jesus didn't have to thank God the Father for the bread. Jesus made the bread. He's God. He's not like us where if we didn't have God's blessings, we would never eat another bite. But Jesus, as our perfect example of how to live the Christian life, took the bread and he, I, can't th- I think he motioned it to heaven. And he gave God thanks. He prayed a prayer. And in some study I did over the last week or so, I found a commentator that I love. His name is Alfred Endersheim. And he's a Jewish scholar that was converted to Christ a historian, a scholar, he's an amazing guy, and I've got the the books of the life of Christ from him, and he tells you that as a scribe or as a rabbi or a teacher in Israel, if Jesus was going to pray the prayer to bless the food, it would have been this prayer. I want you to imagine Jesus putting up the five loaves into the air and praying these words. This is the prayer that he prayed. Blessed art thou, Jehovah our God. King of the world, who calls it to come forth bread from the earth. Now, him knowing all of what Jewish people do and all of the traditions and everything, this was the traditional prayer that Jesus would have prayed when he broke the bread. As we continue in our study, he commanded them to sit down. He got them into ranks, got them organized. He took the five loaves and the two fishes. He looked up to heaven, and he blessed it. He prayed and, and thanked God for the bread, and the fish in front of the whole multitude. Now watch this. He gave them to his disciples to set before them, and the two fishes divided he among them all. Now you need to understand this, and this used to freak me out when I was a kid. You got five loaves of bread. Okay, it's the, it's the Jewish kind of bread, uh, more than likely uh, not have a, any yeast in it. It's probably, unless they gathered something together from some other place, I don't know if the lad guy, the little kid was a Jewish person or not. I don't know for sure. Uh, but I'm just figuring the bread is probably a traditional Jewish bread. It's not very big, and it's certainly not big rising bread like we have in our store. So you got five loaves of that and two fishes. Well, what they did back then, when you sent somebody off to work, the, the wives would make that bread, and then they would either take sardines or some small type of fish that we would use basically as bait. They would take little sardines or some kind of little fish, and then sometimes they would actually make it into a spread, into a pate, and you put that on your bread. This is not made into pate yet, but they're two little bitty fish, okay? They're not big, giant tuna, okay? They're little bitty fish. And when I was a kid, it used to freak me out when people would preach about this in the feeding of the 5,000, because he broke the loaves of bread. But then he passed out and he divided it among them all. That means in that text there, in the original language, it means that he just passed out the fish. Are you with me? He didn't break the fish. When I was a little kid, I kept thinking all the time about, that would be so gross. I mean, if Jesus broke all those fish and just broke them and broke them and broke them to feed 10,000 people, I don't want a broken fish. I don't want to eat a fish where you tore it all apart and the eyeballs hanging out and the tongues hanging out and you got gills everywhere and there's blood everywhere. I don't want that. Y'all are looking at me like you never thought that. Am I the only little kid sitting in junior church thinking these things? (laughs) Probably so. Jesus didn't break the fish. He broke the bread, and then he passed out all the sardines to everybody whole. That just makes me feel better. Apparently, y'all don't care, but I like it. (laughs) Now, notice verse 42. Now, those of you who didn't know the end of the story, you know that there was 12 baskets of fragments or broken pieces that were brought back. Now, those were not crumbs. Okay, those were the whole broken pieces of bread and the whole fish. 
They were all thrown in the basket. How many baskets were there? How many disciples are there? Every one of them got a basket before they took up all the fragments. They all got a basket, and Jesus broke the bread, put the fishes in there, and he filled up every basket. And the disciples took it out, and they went out to the rows of the people, and they shared it with the people. They took all they wanted. They kept eating. Somebody, I'm sure, called them back and said, hey, I need some more fish, man, over here. You know, I remember a, a long time ago, there was a Mexican place where you just put the flag up, and they keep bringing you food. That's the way it was. So the disciples got their basket. They, Jesus is just taking the bread, and he keeps breaking it and breaking it and breaking it. Now, why can we struggle about believing this? Any, per, any God that can step out into the middle of nothing, when nothing has existed, nothing is created, and say, let there be light, and all of what we know and don't know about our universe is created from that moment, it's not a hard thing for you to break some bread and multiply it. I thought about this the other day in my office when I was studying for this. What would, I'm going to just go ahead and come down. I know the TV can't follow me down here, but that's okay. Just imagine if the disciples got the, ba the baskets, and they got all this fish. It's flowing over with fish and bread. And just imagine if they just passed it on and just shared it with the first two rows. What would have Yeah, Brother Kurt's happy. <laughs> what about all y'all? What is the bread in this miracle representing? It's representing the bread of life. Jesus, the bread of life, the gospel. You know what's happened in America? We've just shared the bread with the first two rows. People in America have heard the gospel a hundred thousand times. And there's people in Africa that have never even seen the bread. I thought about the fact that if the disciples had just been lazy and just passed it out to the first couple rows, the verse 42 wouldn't be there. The Bible says, and they did all eat. And not only did they eat, but they were filled. You know, everybody came away from this miracle just like I did from that restaurant with the steak. They came away and they said, hey, you guys want some dessert? No. No, no dessert for me. Matter of fact, I may not eat for three more days. Why? Because Jesus is the only one that can satisfy. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy you. The religious leaders could not do this. They can't take bread and multiply it. They can't take two fishes and make it 10,000 fish. They can't multiply the bread. They can't multiply the fish. They can't and do. They are not able to create things. They're not able to satisfy you. When you look at this world and all of our pleasures and all of our belongings and all of our material wealth and all the money you have in the bank and everything that you are working and striving for, it will not satisfy you. Only Jesus can satisfy you. And the only peaceful times in my life where I really felt satisfied was when I am seeking after the Lord and I am spending all of my time with the Lord and praying and, and fasting and, and reading God's word and doing what God has asked me to do. Those are the times when I'm at total peace and I feel satisfied in my life. But as soon as I let this culture and this world around us talk me into again, seeking after a bicycle or after a truck or after a, a, a car or after a new suit or after new shoes or after a promotion or a raise or more money or a vacation or whatever it is. Even Krispy Kreme donuts don't satisfy me. You say, well, they're pretty good. I know. They're real good. And I feel real good about two minutes after I eat it. But guess what happens the next morning? I want more. You see, this world can't satisfy you. Only Jesus can satisfy that longing in your heart. Jesus is the only one that can fill you. He's the only one that can feed you. He's the only one that can fill your life with joy and peace and comfort. I want you to see something, and I'm going to try to do this quickly. But Jesus, all through the Bible, talks about the fact that he can satisfy you. I don't think we get it. We don't believe it. Or I'm not sure what happens between here and there. 
but we just don't buy into it. If we bought into this, now listen, if we really truly believe that Jesus could satisfy us, the only thing we would be concentrated on is being with Jesus. But that seems to be the last thing we do sometimes. Proverbs 27, 20 says, hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. We see that all the time. I see people on the news that are billionaires, some of them that have $100 billion. You couldn't spend that in a lifetime, and they're still not satisfied. I see people that are kings and rulers over gigantic empires, not satisfied. I see the famous people of the world that everybody knows their name, and they're on TV all the time, and everybody just about worships them. They're not satisfied. I'm telling you, that stuff will not satisfy your heart. It won't bring you peace. It won't bring you joy in your life. Only Jesus can satisfy you. Psalm 16, 11 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Believer, stop trying to satisfy yourself with the things of the world. And just understand, only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you've never put your full faith and trust in Jesus for his salvation that he offers to you. Maybe you don't know what would happen to you when you pass from this life to the next. Maybe you're not sure that the gospel is real. Maybe you're not even sure that everything this church believes is real. That you, you're just really in a place where you're not sure about anything. Can I tell you that Jesus can save you this morning? He can give you eternal life. He can wash away all of your sins. He can forgive every sin that you've ever committed because of what he did on the cross of Calvary. He died on that cross for you in your place to pay the price for your sins so that he could give you eternal life. And all you have to do this morning is take it. All you have to do this morning is receive it, believe it, and Jesus can be your Savior. We'd love to help you with that today if that's a, a situation and a concern in your life. If you're not sure that you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. Believer, those of you that are saved this morning, it's just time that we stop trying to satisfy our heart and our soul and our life with the things of this world. They don't satisfy you. Only Jesus can fill you. Jesus is the only one that can do the miracle of filling a heart and a soul of a human life. Heavenly Father, we love you today, and God, we are so grateful that when we partake and we spend time and we enjoy you, we walk away full. And Lord, it stays with us, and we don't have to continue to wonder and continue to seek and continue to try new things to make ourselves feel better. Lord, if we spend time with you, we just walk away full. God, you're the only one that can satisfy us. And I pray that you'd help people today in this auditorium, true believers, people that are sincere, people that really want to serve you, but it seems like there's some kind of disconnect between believing what we've preached today and actually applying it to their lives. Would you help them to do that today? And God, if there's one here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, would you help them to make that decision today to believe on you, to repent of their sins, and to ask you to come into their heart and save them and give them eternal life. Would you help them to do that today? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As Brother Jeff sings a verse of invitation this morning, maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart. Maybe you felt something. It's